Beautiful, beautiful spring day here at Gettysburg. I'm John Hoptak. I'm a park ranger. I've been with the National Park Service for, I think, nine years now. Uh, I've been here for three seasons at Gettysburg. The prior six, I've worked at Antietam Battlefield down in Western Maryland. So it's a real pleasure to be with you here this afternoon. I will let you know that today, June 7th, is the kickoff of our busy summer schedule. We have uh, 16 free programs being offered today various places throughout the park. This evening I'll be presenting a campfire program at 8.30 over at Tour Stop 6, the park amphitheater, and that's going to focus in on an event that happened, oh, over a hundred miles behind you to the south at the Battle of Petersburg, the digging of the, the mine. Uh, so you're always more than welcome to attend any, all of those programs, but this afternoon we're going to focus in on the cemetery. And you know, Gettysburg is so much more than the story of bullets and bayonets and strategy and tactics. This is also a story of sacrifice and sorrow. And what I want to do today is focus in on what this battle meant, okay, for the soldiers who fought here. Uh, and to help tell the story, I'm going to rely upon this fella. You can see here, just a Union private, okay, he was from Addison County, Vermont. He was 25 years old. He stood five foot nine. You're a typical soldier. The only thing rather unusual about him was his name. His name was Pliny White, okay, Pliny Fisk White. And Pliny White fought here at the Battle of Gettysburg as a member of the 14th Vermont Infantry. Okay, so as we go throughout the, the program today, I'm gonna touch back upon Pliny and tell you a little bit about his story uh, here. Uh, but I really wanna begin on the morning of July 4th. Okay, so much of history ends with the repulse of Pickett's charge on July 3rd. You know, the Confederate troops were turned back just over the distance here, down the ridge line. And when Pickett's charge was repulsed, the Battle of Gettysburg ended. But did it? Well, for a lot of these soldiers, it would go on and on and on, especially for those who were injured. And of course, for the families of the killed, it would go on for the rest of their lives. But on the morning of July 4th, it was Independence Day. If anyone cared to notice, it was the 4th of July. It rained overnight and quite heavily at times. And by the morning, well, there was no sunrise. Just those gloomy kind of mornings where it's raining on and off. And that morning, Union soldiers who had been in position up on this high ground called Cemetery Hill, they began to creep their way down the hillside and up through the streets of Gettysburg. The population of 2,400 people of Gettysburg had spent the last four days huddled inside their basements. But that morning, one of the soldiers from the 11th Army Corps noticed that one of the residents was standing by her window and motioning him over. Very important news. The rebel army, she said, had evacuated the town overnight. So the Union Army would begin to make its way through the town. And as the hours passed that Saturday, George Meade and the Union Army realized that Robert E. Lee had backed away from the fight. They haven't gone entirely, but they have taken up a new defensive line along Seminary Ridge and north of town along Oak Hill. It was pretty obvious at that point that there would be no more fighting that gloomy Saturday. And imagine if you were one of those people who lived in town and you had spent the last four days in the corner of your basement. Overhead, you could hear the shouts and the cries. You could hear the footsteps of soldiers going into and out of your home going into your pantry, taking perhaps pillows or blankets from your bed to help with the wounded. What kind of sights would you see when you emerged on that 4th of July? Just think about the aftermath of this battle, one of the worst man-made destructions in American history on these people's backyards. 165,000 soldiers had fought here and just over 51,000 had become casualties. That included perhaps eight, maybe 9,000 killed in action. Well more than 20,000 wounded, 10 times the population of Gettysburg and wounded. The rest either marching to the rear as prisoners of war or held in captivity. So it would prove to be the bloodiest battle of the American Civil War. The Confederate Army began their retreat that evening. As the rain continued to fall, what was left of the Army of Northern Virginia began to back away from Gettysburg, marching west toward a place called Fairfield, up and over the South Mountain Range, and then south in retreat. Robert E. Lee had come north hoping to secure a victory on Union soil, and as his columns moved away from this place, he realized that that victory had not been gained. But one of the prices of victory for the Union Army was burying the dead. 
And on that Saturday, all around us, all around these battlefields, the smoke has begun to lift, the rain has begun to wash the bloodstains from the grass and from the rocks. Union soldiers began this great task of burying the dead. Now, as victors of the field, they would take greater effort to identify their own dead. Let's say we all marched off together in 1861 to go fight. And let's say I was struck down and killed during this battle. Well, of course you know who I am. There's a good chance we grew up together. We went to school together from our hometown. So when I was buried, you would pull the top of a cracker box off or an ammunition crate, and you would get a knife or a, or a pencil, and you would write my name upon it and take, place it over a temporary grave. The dead were buried where they fell. In some places, they were brought to collection points. In other places, they were accorded individual graves. For the Confederate troops, little effort was made to identify the dead. Mostly it was trench burial, perhaps digging down three, three and a half feet, maybe going 20 feet long. You place a layer of deceased Confederate soldiers in, over top perhaps unrolled their blankets, and another layer on top. Throw the dirt over. This was a task they wanted to get done as quickly as possible. Along some points of the line, among the suffering, and among these burial parties, you could hear bands playing music. Union bands began to play patriotic songs like Hail Columbia. It was the 4th of July after all. But you know, most of the reason why they did that was not to celebrate Independence Day. It was to help drown away the sounds of the dying and the wounded. It was so pitiful in their cries for help. Among those wounded was Pliny White a fellow who I had just introduced a few minutes ago. You know, when the war began in 1861, Pliny White decided against volunteering. He felt he had another duty, one to his family. You see, he was 25 when the war began, and his father had just passed away two years earlier. He had a number of younger sisters at home, and he felt that he needed to take care of them, take care of the family farm, and take care, of course, of his widowed mother. So when Lincoln, in 1861, issued a call for volunteers, he decided to stay home and help with the family, help with the farm. And a reason why he decided to stay home was that in 1861, if you volunteered, you volunteered for three years. That was a long commitment. But the Union, Confederate governments, they absolutely had no shortage of volunteers in 1861. But by 1862, it would be a different story. Now the volunteers are not flocking to the recruiting stations to sign up once they realize what this war was. So in the summer of 1862, with the end of the war nowhere in sight, Abraham Lincoln needs more men. So he issued a call for more volunteers. Only this time, you were only committed for nine months. A nine-month term of service. So in August, in late August of 1862, Pliny White up there in Addison County, Vermont, decided that because of this, he will go off and serve his country. He promised to send the family money from his monthly pay, and he did. He, in fact, entered the Army October 20th of 1862 as a private. He was shipped off to war, and he found soldier life to be incredibly boring. The next eight months was nothing but garrison duty, guard duty. He would write many frequent letters home, and in those letters he would include money to his family to help their support. And as D June turned to July of 1863, Pliny White and the soldiers of the 14th Vermont looked ahead to that date, July 20th, when they would all be discharged. Well, three weeks prior to that, the soldiers of the 14th arrived on this battlefield. And on the morning of July 2nd, they happened to find themselves positioned, all just a few hundred yards behind you, south of a little copse of trees along Cemetery Ridge. And when they arrived in position, they began to realize that they might be called into battle. So Pliny decided to write another letter home. Okay, another thing about Pliny that we could relate to, okay, he had, his, he had a crush on this girl back at home, okay, who he'd left behind. Her name was Lamira. And on July 2nd, he wrote to her. He said, My dear Lamira, the chances are very favorable that today we shall go into battle. Though I do not fear, yet it may be that this is the last time I write to you. I love you as ever and think of you often. And if we meet no more again on earth, I hope I shall be worthy to meet you where there will be no more parting. Their baptism of fire came especially the following day on July 3rd. 
Pliny White and his Vermonters helped to repulse Pickett's charge, and during that afternoon fight, Pliny's arm was shattered with a musket ball. His right arm was shattered. He was carried behind the lines behind Cemetery Ridge. He was still in good spirits. His arm was amputated. So among those who, was cry who were crying out for help on July 4th was White, okay, in one of these makeshift field hospitals. Once the Confederate Army, though, evacuated the town of Gettysburg, the Union doctors and surgeons began to move these wounded men from these temporary field hospitals into more established hospitals. One of them was the Lutheran Seminary Building on the west side of town, where much of the first day's battle action had occurred. Well, Pliny White was one of those soldiers taken over to that seminary hospital. And as Pliny White was recovering and thinking about how he's going to go on living as a farmer without his right arm, as he began to dictate letters home with the nurses that were there on staff, the Union troops continued to bury the dead. Thousands of them. And as the days, weeks, and months passed, thousands more would die of their wounds. It was a miserable place, a gloomy place. And did I mention the rain? It only continued to fall during the next few days. A lot of the loose earth that had been thrown over top these graves did what? Washed away. A lot of free roaming animals, like dogs and hogs, began to root out some of the graves. And on July 10th, one week after the battle, the Union Army had left. George Meade, after all, has a job to do. He can't stay here to make sure that everyone is buried. He had to go after the Confederate Army. So on July 10th, with the Union Army gone, the governor of Pennsylvania traveled down here to Gettysburg and did what you're doing today. He toured the field. He was taken on a tour of Culp's Hill and Little Round Top. He was seeing civilians finishing the job of burying the dead. And he was told about the battle and the strategy, but his attention was increasingly drawn to those graves. At some places, he said, arms, heads, legs were protruding from the ground. He actually witnessed animals rooting up graves. Now I ask you, is that any way to honor the dead? Governor Curtin didn't think so. So Governor Curtin would decide that something had to be done. He's going to turn upon a political acquaintance of his in town, a 32-year-old lawyer by the name of David Wills. David Wills was a local. He went to the local college, Pennsylvania College. Of course, today is Gettysburg College. He studied law under Thaddeus Stevens, that great abolitionist in the House of Representatives. Because of his position, Governor Curtin turned upon him and he asked if he would be his agent in establishing a cemetery at Gettysburg, a cemetery for Union dead. We have to remember that this was only a few weeks after the battle. The war would go on for two more years. Never any thought given whatsoever about burying Confederates in this cemetery. The Confederate dead would remain where they were in those mass trenches across the battlefield for another 10, 11 years. That's when ladies' aid societies from throughout the South would come north and exhume the remains, take them back south, which is why today, if you went to Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, you'll see a marker, a monument at the top of a hill within this plot, 2,000 soldiers who died at Gettysburg, mostly unknown. It's a real tragedy, a real shame, that almost half of Civil War burials throughout the country are listed as unknown. And we're going to see a few of those today. So what we're going to do now is continue along our way. We're going to talk about David Wills and the steps that he took to transform this hilltop. And of course, we're going to talk also about Pliny White and his struggle to recuperate from his wound. Any questions before we go on? A couple things I do want to mention. This is a speaker's platform behind me, a rostrum. Uh, it was constructed in 1879. Since that time, I believe eight presidents have spoken from there. Abraham Lincoln was not one of them, okay? Uh, he was in the grave 16 years by the time, or I'm sorry, 15 years by the time that was built. Across from the rostrum behind you is a rather unique memorial that was placed there in 1912, dedicated. It pays tribute not to a soldier, not to a regiment, or to a person, but to a speech. That is the Lincoln Speech Memorial, or the Gettysburg Address Memorial. That is also not where Lincoln stood when he gave the Gettysburg Address. I will show you the location, okay? Well, very good. Let's follow me up along this walk path. As I mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to touch only briefly upon the battle action that occurred up here, but I think it's important to, to talk briefly about it. On the morning of July 1st, as the Union Army began approaching Gettysburg, of course, they came up from the roads 
leading from the South. And uh, John Buford, John Reynolds, and some other notable names for the Union Army all passed by this hilltop, all recognized the importance of this place. But it was Oliver Howard, the commander of the Union 11th Corps, when he rode up to this hilltop with his staff, he turned to one of his staff officers and said, this seems to be a good position, wouldn't you say, Colonel? And the Colonel looked at him and said, General, this is the only position, okay? And you can see why, if you look through the trees, out in the distance, perhaps on the other side of town, you might actually get to see the Peace Light Monument at Tour Stop Number 2 on Oak Hill, the first day's battlefield to the west and to the north. And as a precaution, as a contingency, Oliver Howard would place the division of troops up on this hilltop just in case the Union Army would break, would buckle under the weight of the Confederates approaching, which they did. Four o'clock that afternoon, the Union Army retreated back through town. They would rally on this hilltop, and this would become the key spot for the rest of the battle, the key of that fish hook line. And after the battle, you could try to imagine what this would have looked like. It was not a beautiful hillside like it is right now. Much of it was bare, open, devoid of trees. There were small plots of vegetables or perhaps some crops growing that the folks of town who did not have a backyard would rent out or lease out. Imagine what thousands of soldiers and hundreds of horses did to the ground, trampling the grass underfoot. And imagine what thousands of artillery shells did when they crashed into this hilltop, tearing up the landscape, scattered debris and accoutrement. Behind, or behind me, in front of you, you're looking into the Evergreen Cemetery. That cemetery was placed here in 1852 by the people of town. That is where they buried their beloved the town cemetery, which is why this hilltop was known, even at the time of the battle, as Cemetery Hill. Some of the Confederate shells that came screeching in hit those stones, scattering the marble and the granite in all directions, forcing Union troops in some places to begin to dismantle what was left of the standing stones just to prevent against that. This hillside was wrecked. So David Wills, the first thing he would do, of course, decide where he wanted this cemetery to be. He had the authority from Governor Curtin to do this, and there was never any question in his mind where he wanted it to go. He wanted to go on Cemetery Hill, adjacent to the town cemetery. Okay, again, this was the key spot. This was the rallying point of the Union. But he had to purchase the land. So he formed committees, and they went to all the northern states, okay, based upon your representation in Congress. That's how much money you were asked to donate, okay? Pennsylvania, New York, they began to contribute funds. Massachusetts, all the northern states began to send money. And soon, David Wills was able to purchase 17 acres of ground here for a cost of just under $2,400, $2,500. Okay, in today's currency, I think it would be nearly $50,000. So, not too bad for 17 acres. He purchased the hillside, and then he hired a landscaper. Okay, I'm sure many of us, transforming our backyards, making it look nice, hired landscapers to come by. Well, that's what David Wills did. He employed this fellow by the name of William Saunders, best in the business. He had come to America from Scotland, and he began this transformation in the United States. Cemeteries are not just places to bury the dead. Let's make them rural parks. Let's make them places where we could go for a stroll. Let's make them places where we could go for a picnic. Okay, so he began this transformation of the cemeteries in the U.S. He was hired by Wills. And Saunders came up here, and he began to envision how he wanted this cemetery to be. And remember, there's no guidebook to follow. This is one of the first national cemeteries in the nation. So there's no rule book. He just stood here, and he looked into the Evergreen Cemetery. And when you look in there today, or when you drive by any cemetery in any town, you'll look at the different sizes and shapes of the tombstones. What does a large tombstone imply? Rich, wealthy, socially prominent. Okay, these are kind of haphazardly scattered. There may have been a pattern at one point, but of course, with the more and more you're bearing, the less you could do that. So look at this cemetery. And now look behind you at the National Cemetery. You can see what a difference. Here, the graves, the stones are flat. They're arranged in a semicircular formation around a central point. That central point is the National Soldiers Monument, which we'll talk about at our next stop. So Saunders wanted to go with this idea of equality. He doesn't care how much money you had. He doesn't care if you came from a socially prominent family. He doesn't even care if you were a colonel or a private. You'd be buried side by side, 
each given the same stone. So Saunders will go about this task of transforming the hillside here, and there's one more thing for David Wills to do. This would be the grim work, okay? This would be the work of reinterring the dead. So that summer, he advertised. 32 people submitted bids. They wanted this job. Samuel Weaver of town, he said that for $1.59 per body, he will bring the dead to this location. He got the contract. So late that summer and into the fall of 1863, Samuel Weaver and a team of laborers would travel by wagon all across the battlefields where the dead had been buried. They're searching every foot, okay, for any possible remnants of a grave. And Samuel Weaver insists that he be present every time that happened because he wanted to ensure that there were no Confederate soldiers buried here by mistake. So how would Weaver identify the dead? Well, in some cases, you had still those temporary headboards that we talked about with a name inscribed and a regiment. Other times, he would look into pockets for diaries, for letters, for anything that might reveal identity. He tried his best to get name and state. If he was unable to get your name, he tried to get what state you served from, from the buttons you wore, from the buckle you had, or for anything else. Unfortunately, for 979 soldiers, he was unable to determine a name or a state. Those soldiers were buried as totally unknown. So if you look over here in this direction, you'll see a plot of stones raised up, square stones. That is one plot of totally unknown soldiers buried here. There's a corresponding one on the opposite side of the soldier's monument, but in between, the dead are arranged by state. One of the ironies, wouldn't you say? In a war for the Union, a war to preserve the nation, the Civil War dead are buried by their state. Speaks volumes about the meaning of states' rights at the time. There are just about 3,500 soldiers buried here from the Civil War, but there are 3,000 more other soldiers buried here up through the conflict in Vietnam. Those graves are on the outlying area of the walk path. When you see those graves, you will see soldiers from Tennessee buried next to Pennsylvania, Maine, Texas. No distinction. Only in here is there. So Samuel Weaver will go to work and he will travel the battlefields. In fact, he removed dead from as far away as Hanover, 16 miles away, to bring them back here. And one of the soldiers that Samuel Weaver would bring back here late that summer would be Pliny White. So we're going to go talk about his final days at our next stop. Any questions? Very good. Let's continue this way. We'll have to be careful, of course, not to walk on any of the stones. We are looking upon the National Soldiers Monument here at Gettysburg. This was one of the oldest monuments to be placed. In fact, it was dedicated here on July 1st of 1869, six years after the battle. Speaking that day at the dedication ceremony was none other than George Meade, the victor of the battle brought back to deliver a speech here. On top is the figure of Liberty, standing atop a pedestal. At the base are four figures, four marble figures. We are looking upon the figure of war to the left, and the figure of war is actually telling the Battle of Gettysburg, the story of what happened here, to the figure of history, who's writing it down, who's recording it. On the reverse side are the figures of plenty, holding harvests of grains and other crops, and peace is an industrial worker. And of course, America was entering into its industrial age. We'll see the other two when we get to our final stop today. But I did want to mention this soldier's monument, and while we're here, Looking west, looking on the other side of town, through the trees, you might see a white steeple standing up in the distance. To the left of that, you might see the smaller green top dome of the Lutheran Seminary building. Okay, very prominent landmark on the field. A lot of folks remember it only as an observation post for Buford and Reynolds and so on. But after the battle, that would be a hospital. And it was in that hospital on the morning of August 5th just a month and two days after his wounding, that Pliny White would succumb to his injury. So we'll talk about his final moments now at his gravesite here. Now truly, there's no end to the number of programs that could be developed here at the cemetery because every one of these soldiers had their own story to tell. 
Uh, but I wanted to focus in on Pliny today. Uh, Pliny White, as if you recall, he left Vermont the following October, became a soldier. He looked forward to going home. Imagine what was going through his head as he lay in a hospital bed on the other side of Gettysburg on July 20th, knowing that his comrades of the 14th Vermont, those who survived the battle, are all boarding train cars and heading back home. When they arrived back home, the folks would be out to celebrate, to welcome them back with parades and so on. Would Lamira be there? The young lady he left behind. All of that going through his head. But again, he did his best to keep up his spirits. He dictated letters to the nurses who were tending to him. And they, he wrote, he, he talked about the good treatment he was getting. He talked about the good food he was eating. Well, on August 5th, that morning, Pliny White died of his injury. Whether it was from the wound itself or perhaps an infection from the amputation. But he did pass away. And that night, one of the nurses who was tending to him wrote a letter back to his mother and to his two younger sisters. And she wrote, How my heart does ache to think about all the mothers and sisters at home while their loved ones are groaning and dying among strangers, all caused by this unjust war. That letter speaks volumes when you think about how many other letters that nurse had to write, how many other soldiers she witnessed perish. Unjust is a question that a lot of folks north and south were grappling with in the summer of 63. Was it worth it? Abraham Lincoln would come here in November and try to explain why it was. So now we're going to make our way to where the platform would have been on that November day, and we'll conclude our tour there. Within a matter of months, just months, David Wills, this young lawyer from town, had worked to transform this hillside into one of the first national cemeteries in the United States. We talked about his efforts at hiring the landscaper, at hiring a gentleman to remove the remains. There was only one more thing left to do. And what he wanted to do was plan, prepare, an appropriate ceremony dedicating this cemetery. And when he looked at his calendar, he went to October. October 23rd was the date that he circled. That would be the date of the dedication. And to give the dedication address, the main speech, he wanted the foremost orator of his day. It wasn't Abraham Lincoln. It was a 69-year-old gentleman by the name of Edward Everett. And today, of course, his name is not nearly as wide known as Lincoln. But at the time, he was known throughout the country, north and south. He was once president of Harvard. He served in the Massachusetts Assembly. He served in the U.S. Senate, governor of Massachusetts. But his main claim to fame was his oratory. You know, in the days before television and radio and movies, folks would go down to the local theater, the local park, and listen to people speak. And this guy was good. Okay, so that's why Wills wanted him. The invitation goes out, and Everett accepted, but there's a problem. <laughs> the invitation went out near the end of September, which gave Everett less than a month to plan his speech. That would not do, he said. He wanted to know this battle, to come here, to tour the field. So change the date, and I'll do it. That's what Wills did. Turn the calendar page, he circled November 19th. That would be the dedication day. And it was on November 2nd where Wills formally invited the president. He sent the telegraph to the White House. Now, Governor Curtin perhaps had talked to Lincoln before about doing this, but the formal invitation arrived after the first set date. And he asked the president if he would be willing to come up here and attend this dedication ceremony and set apart the ground here uh, with a few appropriate remarks, and at the same time help to assuage the anguish of those who lost their sons or husbands or brothers here. Lincoln accepted. He sensed the import of this occasion. Okay? He accepted immediately and he would start to work on what was his first prepared speech since his inaugural address way back in March of 61. He thought about it. What would he say? What did he have to say? By 1863, there was widespread opposition. While today, in 2014, Abraham Lincoln consistently ranks near the top of our greatest presidents, in 1863, he would have ranked near the bottom. Two years of civil war, hundreds of thousands of families impacted, devastated. And that question, is it worth it, 
sprang up everywhere. Part of, the, part of the reason why Lee came north into Pennsylvania was to build upon this growing anti-Lincoln, anti-war sentiment in the north. So Lincoln would view this as an occasion to remind the people what this war was and why it was so important. He arrived November 18th. The town of Gettysburg was, was packed with thousands of people who were here for the occasion. It was there at the David Wills house where he spent the night where he finished up his remarks. And on the morning of November 19th, Abraham Lincoln would have left the Wills house and paraded through the town itself and arrived here late morning. If we were here, there would have been about 15,000 people on this hilltop. And again, at the time, there's no soldier monument. Many of these trees were not here. Only one third of the graves behind you had been dug. And there is no fence separating the National Cemetery from the town cemetery. This fence does not come in for another 60, 70 years, 1930s. So if we were looking forward, we would have been looking toward the speaker's platform, which stood in the confines of the Evergreen Cemetery. We don't have a precise location. A lot of folks are surprised to discover that. Some of my colleagues like to point out to the Slentz family graves here with their fingers pointing can you see them? It stood right behind there. Somewhere behind those graves, between this grave with the flag and a mausoleum crypt. Somewhere in that area. There were fewer graves at the time. Folks would have stood among those that were standing. And for two hours, the crowd was enraptured by Edward Everett. Everett spoke, and he was very demonstrative. He went through a whole history of the battle talking about the strategy and the tactics, talking about the three days. 13,000 words. He spoke for two hours straight. You know, we sit through a two-hour movie in the theater. Again, same thing. And when he was done, the crowd applauded. It broke into applause. A choir then sang, and Abraham Lincoln stood up. Behind him, David Wills, Governor Curtin, Secretary of State Seward, Edward Everett. And as opposed to Everett, who spoke for two hours, Abraham Lincoln would speak for fewer than three minutes. And as opposed to Everett, who spoke more than 13,000 words, Abraham Lincoln spoke just 272. That was it. But in the aftermath, Edward Everett would write to Lincoln, I should flatter myself if I came as near to the central point of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. And since that time, what Lincoln said has become one of the greatest political speeches in American history. It began with a quick history lesson, okay? What I like about the Gettysburg Address is past, present, future. He links them all together, okay? And even us today. It was just four score and seven years, 87 years since the nation was founded, right? He doesn't go back to the Constitution. He goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. On that July 4th, there's that date again, 1776. So four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. A nation that was based upon that great idea that all men are created equal. So that was Lincoln's history lesson. And then he reminded the people here what they're doing. But now here we are, just a few generations later, and look at us. Look what we've become. We are now involved in this great civil war. We are fighting one another, Americans. What was the war? It was a test. It was a test to determine whether or not such a nation, so conceived and so dedicated, could even work. And now here we are today on that brisk November 19th. We have come here to dedicate a portion of a great battlefield of the war as a final resting place for those who gave their lives. He doesn't mention the word Gettysburg. He never once talked about the battle. He doesn't even talk about Confederacy, Southerners. He could have said this at almost any battlefield. We have come here today to dedicate this land. But you know what? They've already done that. The soldiers buried here have already dedicated this land. They have hallowed this ground much greater than we can. So then what are we doing here? What is the point of this exercise? Well, we have come here to take inspiration. That from these honored dead, we need to rededicate ourselves, commit ourselves to that great task remaining. That great task remaining. Does he say to end the war? 
No. That great task is to rally upon that nation that the founders back in 1776 had established with that idea of equality for all. That work, that unfinished work, of course, will continue even today. If we could dedicate ourselves to seeing this war through to the end, to take inspiration from those who died in defense of that cause, then we could do a few things. We could prove that they did not die in vain, okay? That it was worth it in answering that nurse's letter after Pliny White passed away. We could prove that they did not die in vain, and we could prove to the world that a government of the people, and by the people, and for the people can work. And I just probably spent three times as many words trying to explain what Lincoln said. <laughs> but it does remind us, okay? Coming here, it does remind us of the sacrifice, of what this war meant to the families, to the soldiers, and to the nation. And that Gettysburg Address, it still speaks to us even today. There's still some unfinished work, right? And I want to thank you so much for coming out with me on this beautiful afternoon. I'll see you on other programs, I hope. So thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Thank you.